How do we improve our lives and our society by practicing humility? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. In this episode, we discuss humility, its many aspects, and ways it offers hope for the future. We're going to play for you an interview we conducted with Dr. Pellen Kesebeer. Pellen Kesebeer, Ph.D., is an honorary fellow at the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She is a social psychologist interested in the study of happiness and virtue and she has a deep interest in existential psychology, particularly in how the human awareness of mortality affects various psychological dynamics. She's the co-author of over three dozen scholarly publications, including Humility, the Soil in Which Happiness Grows. Here's the interview with Dr. Kesebeer. Pelham, welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. Thank you for being our guest. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. So let me start. We're we're talking about humility and just very basic. What is humility? Yeah, humility, I think of it as a personality trait, being a personality psychologist. So all of us, we exist on this dimension that ranges from very low humility to very high humility. And what does this dimension capture? What is it about? Well, it is about how we relate to ourselves, to others, and to, I would say, to reality in general. I find it helpful to think of it as having true perspective and being at peace with it. So what do I mean when I say humility is having quote-unquote true perspective and being at peace with it? Well, for one thing, it means that we have proper knowledge of ourselves, our strengths, our weaknesses. We can afford an honest look at ourselves, but at the same time, we are okay with it. We are accepting of it. We do not feel inferior when there are certain areas where we are weak, which all of us obviously do, but we also do not feel superior to others in areas where we are better than others. So that does not mean that we do not rightfully deem ourselves better in certain domains than others. Like if you are, say, if you are a great piano player, or if you are great at your job, or if you are a fast runner, Obviously, you know that you do not deny that you are not, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not actually that good. That's not what we mean when we talk about humility. It's rather about not deriving specialness or a sense of superiority from your strengths and not deriving a sense of inferiority from your weaknesses. So that's one aspect of humility. It's about how we relate to ourselves. When it comes to our relations to others, again, humility manifests itself as as seeing ourselves connected to others and seeing ourselves on the same plane with others. So it's about not needing to feel superior to others, for example, to be okay. So that would be actually the opposite of humility. If you really constantly need to feel superior to others to feel okay, it's not about constantly requiring validation from others. Rather, it is about connecting to others in an unencumbered, benevolent, easygoing way. And finally, when I say that humility is about how we relate to reality, what I mean is that when we look at the broader context of existence, A humble person is aware that against the cosmic scale of time and space, we are pretty insignificant, right? So each of us is, as an individual, cross against the scale of time and space. We are small. But at the same time, each of us is also very significant, and we can create a big difference in life, apply ourselves to it. So humility is all about these things. And maybe the last thing I will add is that At the core of humility lies a sense of inner security. 
to be able to relate to yourself and to others and to reality in such healthy ways, you need to have a serene, calm confidence, a type of inner security, which I don't think it's easy. That's why um, we don't necessarily see that many humble people. It's not easy to feel secure in this world that is inherently insecure and we are fragile human beings. So being humble is not easy, but I think it's worth trying to be more humble than we are for many of us. This is wonderful to hear you explain it in person because Ken and I were introduced to your ideas in a podcast. We were talking about narcissism, which of course is a big topic in the era of Trump, which now feels like 100 years ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And we were saying, oh, humility and gratitude are narcissism antimatter. And Sheldon Solomon pulled out your article and he said, well, read it point by point. And it was exactly the opposite of narcissism, what you were and what you're just saying now. It's wonderful. Yes, you're right. It's not easy to find people who are that confident in themselves. Maybe the Dalai Lama or. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are probably a few around, but not very many. Well, and Amer- American society doesn't make it very easy on us. I mean, since since advertising in the 50s and 60s, they kind of built a whole industry on making us feel insecure. And like we need to buy certain things and look a certain way in order to count. And a lot of those are very calculated and uh, self-serving. Yep. And we're the most individualistic nation on earth. Right, right. And there are studies showing that there is a link between individualism and narcissism. Typically, more individualistic societies, very understandably, they also score higher in narcissism. And in the U.S., going back to what you said, Ken, in the U.S., there are some studies suggesting that the level of narcissism and entitlement, it actually has increased in the past decades. We have studies, me and my twin sister, who is also a social psychologist, we did a study where we looked at the appearance frequency of the words humble, humility and humbleness in American books throughout the 20th century. So from 1900 to 2000. And what we found was that from the beginning of the century to the end of the century, there was a a 44% decrease in how frequently these words appeared, words like humility and humbleness. So all of those suggest that, as you said, in the American society, narcissism is or lower levels of humility are an issue. And we quoted a study. I don't remember where it's from. I'm a terrible scholar, by the way. I can't remember names or anything like that. But we saw a study that looked at narcissism in our culture and said that the words I and me appeared in songs more frequently in the last 10, 20 years than they had previously. And we're looking at a pandemic of narcissism. Yes, that's what it has been called, um, the narcissism epidemic. There's a book uh, by that name by uh, scholars Gene Twenge and Keith Campbell. I would actually really recommend that book. It's very, very interesting and very eye-opening. Yeah, but what's the problem with narcissism, as you see it? (laughs) Yeah, you know, think about a narcissistic person that you know, either in your own life or in public life. What makes them problematic? Why is narcissism an issue? Couldn't we just look at it as just another another way of existing you know like i i like let's say i like to be alone you are more extroverted why is why is that a problem well the thing about narcissism one of its defining characteristics is that it is associated with low levels of empathy so at its highest levels at levels where it's really problematic narcissistic people treat others as just but instruments, instruments that serve their own needs or their own desires. 
So like this pen, right? There's a pen in my hand and I use it when I need to write something and it's important to me while I'm using it. But when I'm not using it, when I don't need it, it's nothing to me. I don't care about it. So at the most extreme levels, narcissism and its accompanying levels of low empathy correspond to that. I believe it's very hard to be above a certain age and not having met a narcissistic person who has made life very difficult for us. For some of us, it might be a partner in a romantic relationship. For some, it might be a boss. It's very sad, actually, but there are situations where the narcissistic people in our lives are our parents. And that's really sad because it's very difficult for children to even understand that concept. And that usually leads to certain mental problems in later life. Yeah, but if we go back to the question of why is narcissism problematic, it's because these people oftentimes create relationships that can be called toxic. They hurt people and in their sometimes relentless way to get their own egos, desires and needs met, they discount others and especially if they have power. This is where it gets really, really problematic. When narcissistic people um, achieve power, and especially if their narcissism is combined with maybe low morals, that's a recipe for disaster. That's really where societies face lots of suffering, like certain groups in a society are sometimes, for example, disparaged because of this narcissistic leader. So I think those are the main reasons why narcissism is problematic. Yeah, you're taking us back to, again, to the era of Trump. I'm getting that feeling, that Trump anxiety feeling is coming up (laughs) as you talk about this theoretical person that actually ran this country for four years. Yeah, It's actually taking me back to my former career. I used to work with very high level executives and a lot of them are like that. Oh, yeah. I hate to say it because you said about power, but these are extremely high-end people, and people are standing in line to be used by them, like you said, like a tool, like a pen, because there's a lot of money to be made if you can get yourself into that into that room, into that boardroom. But you can tell it's going on when it's happening, and you're just saying, well, this is uncomfortable, but it's going to be a big, big payday eventually, so let's just hold on and Try not to lose our soul in the process. Yeah. We talk to a lot of people involved in terror management theory, and we always ask them the same question because everyone has a unique take on it. We all see it. I can't remember who said, maybe Ralph Waldo Emerson, that we're all sacred centers of consciousness and we can't, we'll never understand reality in the round. But if we get a view from each different person, we come closer and closer to seeing the exact thing that it is. So we would like to know how you would define terror management theory and then talk about your research on humility regarding terror management theory and whether humility is a defense against death anxiety. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, terror management theory, of course, you know that it argues that as humans are aware of our mortality, unlike other animals, and this can be a source of terrorizing anxiety unless it is effectively managed, And terror management theory argues that this terror or this potential for terror, it is managed by by an existential anxiety buffering system. And this buffering system needs to have certain ingredients to work. And what are those ingredients? Well, a sense of value, a sense of value about oneself, faith in one's worldview, cultural worldview for the most time. And meaning, a sense of meaning, a sense of security, and maybe a sense of transcendence. Those are the magic ingredients. If you have those ingredients, if you have a sense of value, a sense of meaning, a sense of faith in whatever you believe in, security, all of these buffer your anxiety. And because of that, people are highly motivated to pursue those things that give them those magic ingredients. So they pursue self-esteem or they pursue certain worldviews. They believe in certain worldviews that provide them with those ingredients. 
Now, this is term management theory. If we come to my research on the relationship between humility and term management theory, well, term management theory has widely documented that the ways in which people pursue these ingredients of the existential anxiety buffer, they can sometimes take unsavory forms. So for example, they can create prejudice or aggression towards others with different cultural worldviews from you. Or people might engage in self-serving yet immoral ways. So my personal hypothesis was that humble people, people higher in this personality trait of humility, they should actually be less defensive in the face of their mortality. And my reasoning was that humility, it involves a less easily threatened ego. And death or our mortality is the ultimate threat to the self. But um, people who are more humble, they are more aligned with reality. They are more accepting of its limitations. Again, mortality is one of the major ones of those limitations. So because of those reasons, I reasoned that reminders of the fragil fragility of life and the self they shouldn't bother or they shouldn't elicit as defensive reactions from humble people. So I ran a series of studies. I believe there were five studies. And what I found was in line with my expectations, it turns out that higher levels of humility, they are associated with lower death anxiety and lower defensiveness in the face of death thoughts. So participants who were either high in dispositional humility, or in some studies, I actually experimentally manipulated humility. And the way to do it is, for example, asking the participants to remember a time in their life when they felt humbled, right? And even when they were in this experimentally induced humble mindset, it turned out that participants found mortality thoughts less threatening. And they were less likely to respond to death thoughts with prejudicial attitudes um, toward outgroups or with endorsement of self-serving yet unethical behaviors. So that was my finding. So it really shows that I was saying that humility um, epitomizes a healthy relationship to reality. And we see, I believe, in, in this series of studies, we see this confirmed. Basically, humble people, they have a more accepting relationship with that. They are, yeah, they have a less conflicted relationship with the undeniable fact of our mortality. Wow, that's really powerful because, because Ernest Becker talks mostly about self-esteem as a defense against death anxiety. And of course, there are problems with that because self-esteem on steroids is narcissism. And so, yeah, and so also the end of Becker's work leaves you with this profoundly, unfortunately, empty feeling. Depressing. Depressing. Hopeless. <laughs> A few words that come to mind. Yeah. And we're, we're constantly looking for hope. And what you presented was very hopeful us, especially since humility is found in the ancient philosophies, the ancient religions, the ancient texts that are still in our culture, even if they're not emphasized. So this is, this is wonderful to hear you talk about this as a defense against death anxiety. Would you, I, you, you used a phrase that I just absolutely loved, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about it. The quiet ego. Oh, yeah. Well, That's, yeah. That is a nice phrase. It is great, isn't it? What, what is yeah. the quiet ego? Yeah. I use that phrase in the title of my article, actually, the series of studies I talked about. They came in a paper titled, A Quiet Ego, Quiet Death Anxiety. And when I talk about the quiet ego, what I mean is the kind of ego that is not needy, that is not constantly trying to impose itself on the world, the kind of ego 
that is more in harmony with reality. And it is a less problematic kind of ego. And as you said, a quiet ego is, it is actually a healthier kind of self-esteem. It represents a healthier kind of self-esteem. Here's the paradoxical thing. They say that a quiet ego or actually no ego is actually a strong ego. To be able to have a quiet ego, you actually have to have a, as, as I just referred in the beginning, you need to have a very firmly, deeply rooted self-esteem, a healthy kind of self-esteem, a calm, serene self-confidence that does not need to constantly advertise itself, that does not need to constantly promote itself. The loud ego, on the other hand, the boisterous ego, that is in constant pursuit of promoting itself. The quiet ego it just is about a kind of self that does not problematize itself. That's where we want to arrive. A kind of self that is not a problem for us. Obviously, we need to think about ourselves. There's a level of until which it is adaptive and healthy. Obviously, we need all to plan about our future, maybe reflect about our qualities, maybe try to improve some of them. But beyond that, too much self-focus is very problematic. And there are many psychological studies that show that lots of mental disorders have as their common core this hyper-egoicism too much attention on the ego, too much self-focus, too much self-absorption. So the quiet ego is the opposite of that. In uh, your article that I loved reading, you actually described the word happiness. And that was the first time I ever saw anybody try to do that. Would you talk a little bit about what happiness is? Absolutely. Well, in psychology, we study happiness. We also sometimes call it well-being. And some, some researchers, they define these two terms in different ways. When I wrote that paper, what I had in mind was the kind of happiness that is more enduring, that is more sturdy. So it's not about feeling good all the time, but it's going through life in a fundamentally content way. That is what I mean by happiness. When we are going through life, just experiencing more positive, more constructive emotions and having our happiness to be something that is just at the fundamental level, we feel okay. Even if things are not always going our way, even if life does not always treat us the way that we want to, fundamentally we feel okay and just we are content with life as it is. Okay, follow-up question to that. How does humility relate to a happy life? Yes. Well, I believe that humility and enduringly happy life are very much related. There are empirical studies which are looking, uh, starting to look at this question And there are some promising results, but this is still a very young field. And I should also add that it's very difficult to measure humility. So we do not have as much empirical evidence as we want. But I believe that theoretically, there are a lot of reasons to expect humility and happiness to be related. For one, we have said that at the core of humility lies this secure sense of self, And that secure kind of self by itself is a source of contentment in life, right? So if your self-esteem is not unstable, if it is not contingent on the triumphs and the tribulations of the ego, if it doesn't go up and down, up and down like the stock market in line with what is happening with your ego, with what is happening in your life, in your relationships, that in itself provides a really good basis for happiness. So that's one thing. Another thing is that humble people, we know, have better relationships. There are actually studies that show that. And again, that makes a lot of sense because humility is associated with many other great qualities, pro-social qualities such as empathy, generosity, respect, 
compassion, forgiveness. So all of those qualities make a person's relations with others better. And of course, we know that healthy relationships are one of the major sources of happiness. So there is another reason why we expect humble people to be happier. And then I think we have just talked about this, how humility is related to a more accepting relationship with reality. Just humble people are a little bit more protected against the slings and arrows of life, I would say, because they expect those. If you are an entitled person, always expecting life to go your way, you are doomed to face disappointments. At the outset, you have set yourself up for disappointment because obviously life is not going to bend your way effortlessly and all the time. So humble people do expect life to throw them curveballs more than less humble people, more entitled people, which I believe protects them against psychological stress. And again, there are some studies that corroborate that account. Would you describe that then as wisdom? Oh, I absolutely would. I absolutely would. I really believe humility and wisdom are like two sides of a coin. I cannot imagine how a person could be wise without being humble and be humble without being wise. They are very much related. How about humility's relationship to gratitude? Mm, Yeah. Again, there are studies showing that humble people on average are also more grateful. I believe that makes perfect sense because, again, think about gratitude. What is the opposite of gratitude? It is entitlement, right? Gratitude is about receiving things as a gift. It is about not feeling entitled to whatever you receive. It might come from another person. It might come from the universe at large. But if you are a grateful person, you do not take it for granted, but you receive it, as I said, as a gift. On the other hand, an entitled person, and entitlement is one of the core qualities of narcissism, and we do know that it correlates negatively with humility. Entitlement is about... Yeah, like, of course, good things should come my way. Why don't they already, right? And that is very much, um, very much the opposite of humility. We also know that entitlement is closely linked to some undesirable personality traits such as envy. People who are low in humility and who are high in entitlement, they also feel lots of envy. It's, It's another sad quality. It makes life very difficult for the person who has it. Yeah, we like to think of gratitude as acknowledging that you're standing on the shoulders of others. There are no self-made people. Everyone should be grateful for the people that came before them, for them, the people that support them now, the people who grow their food and build their roads, all of those things. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. And like the last thing you said, it's also about feeling a sense of interconnectedness with others, right? Like if you are thankful for the people who grow your food or the people who make sure that clean water comes out of your faucet or the people who created this computer. I mean, it is, it is an acknowledgement. Like none of us could exist without others. The self-sufficiency is, is a myth. And I feel that humble people are more aware of the interconnected nature of being. They are more in tune with the reality of existence and its interconnected nature. Helen, this has been great. We've been talking with social psychologist Helen Kesebeer about humility, society, and a broad range of topics. We're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're having a conversation with Dr. Pelin Kesebeer about humility. Ken, you got a question? Yeah, just before we went to break, you guys were talking about remembering that we're standing on the shoulders of our ancestors and everybody who came before us and made this amazing world that we're in possible. 
And my comment was going to be that I don't know very many young people now who have that sense that you owe something to the person who built the road that you're driving on. Uh, I think people think of roads now like people used to think of the air that we breathe. You know, the air is just here and it's free and for everybody to enjoy. And you don't have to thank anybody except nature for that. And that's not true of roads and it's not true of interconnectivity and social media and the internet um, we enjoy. So I was just going to ask about that. And if anybody is being taught these ideas anymore, it's not my experience because I think people would be a lot healthier and have a lot better chance at the stability that you're talking about that comes from humility. Yeah, I think your question is a lot about the role of culture in cultivating humility and related virtues. And I think it's really important that especially young people have role models or other ways in which these virtues are cultivated. I feel it's also normal to expect that young people in general are more narcissistic, more self-focused. That is almost in the nature of life and youth, early adulthood, those are years when people are trying to build a life for themselves. It's understandable that they're also a bit more self-focused and more narcissistic. But as many psychologists have said, it is requirement of healthy maturing, healthy psychological development that as years go by, people become more other-oriented. So going back to this culture, the role of culture, it is really important that these values find expression in the general culture. If the culture's role models are all narcissistic, attention-seeking, like people who do not exemplify any virtues other than maybe being just attractive, physically attractive, or maybe being rich. All of this is, I feel, it's a lost opportunity for educating young people about what's really valuable in life. You're describing America, basically. The people that we're told to admire, these are high-achieving, famous beautiful, rich, powerful people, they're our heroes, and we're told we're supposed to emulate them. Yeah, I agree, but I also want to add, I always feel when we are talking about like narcissistic leaders or narcissistic like influencers, for example, I feel like, yes, I really wish that those, like other people were the leaders, other people were the influencers, people who are more virtuous people but at the same time we need to think about the followers too i mean why does somebody look at trump and say wow like wow you know like definitely not a virtuous person i cannot see myself vote for this person and then there are other people who are very much attracted to that and the same with influencers right i mean it is the followers who give the power to to these influencers and it is a two way The relationship is bi-directional, right? If we change the followers, maybe those influencers wouldn't become who they are. I do believe that we really need to look at everybody in this equation, not just the people who are the influencers, the leaders, but also the people who gave them the power. And we need to, in a way, educate both. So now we get into some of the tougher questions. (laughs) Like, (laughs) how can humility bring a way for us to unite this badly divided country that we're in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I feel that this is where we can talk about one of the varieties of uh, humility called intellectual humility. Intellectual humility is a concept that has been started to be talked about um, by psychologists, but also by philosophers especially in, in, uh, in the last couple years uh, for reasons that you can imagine. Intellectual humility is about, it's about recognizing and owning our intellectual limitations and not being ego defensive in our pursuit of truth, but rather just respecting truth and valuing truth and being willing to reconsider our 
views, to avoid defensiveness when we are challenged, and just rather than putting our ego first, rather than trying to be right all the time, just being like striving for accuracy. So being more oriented towards the discovery of the truth rather than being oriented towards defending our ego. And so it is really the opposite of intellectual like arrogance or being closed-minded. And again, I feel it's a very difficult quality to cultivate. It does not come naturally to us for, again, for reasons that Ernest Becker delineated, right? Because we want to believe in our cultural worldviews. Like when we believe in something, it provides us with such a sense of security that we are not willing to let it go easily. But at the same time, I believe that if we could cultivate more of this quality, it would at least create more tolerance towards people who do not think like us. It would create a little bit more respect. And humility is about recognizing that, you know, we all, like, it's like we have been, as the existential philosophers would say, we have been just dropped onto this world, right? We have been thrown into this world. And we are all born with certain genes that make us prone to certain things. And then we all grew up in a family, in a culture. And who is to say that, say, if... If I was born with the genes of, let's say, just for the example's sake, the genes uh, of a Trump supporter and grew up in the same family as them, had the exact same life experiences as them, like who is going to say that I wouldn't be like them? I wouldn't think like them. Humility is about recognizing all these limitations that are inherent in the human condition and being a little bit more accepting like that, accepting of those and trying to build a common conversation that centers on the greater good rather than just trying to prove that, no, my view is superior or your, your view is inferior. Ken, do you know anybody, aside from the guests on this show, <laughs> who have intellectual humility? When I first heard that expression, I th- it sounded like an oxymoron to me, you know? <laughs> Like that's just, those are two words that don't go together. But I like the idea that they can go together, like so many of Pellin's ideas that Sheldon brought up initially and that when we were talking about mostly narcissism and he referenced you and your work. But just the idea that a Trump supporter or a woke elitist is going to say, well, gee, you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe I, I didn't think of that or... Well, let me oh. let me rethink my position. Actually, no, both of those groups that you named are what Neil Elgy would have called fundamentalism, which he thought fundamentalism in any form is always the opposite of what we're talking about that tries to get people better. And the first thing is recognizing that you have faults and you don't know everything. And if you spend your life on a, a journey of ideas and discovery, you realize how much there is that you don't know and will never know, which is why they, I can't remember who said, maybe Joseph Campbell, that the wise man always walks with his eyes lowered because he is humble. The more we learn, the more we realize that there is to learn and that we will never in our one lifetime achieve that much knowledge so that the proper posture for a person with wisdom is a humble posture with your eyes lowered to the ground in deference to the greater thing. So in that same vein, Helen, how would you describe the non-fragile ego? How does that relate to what we're saying about humility and happiness? Yeah, non-fragile ego, again, is the kind of ego that is not easily threatened. The kind of ego that is more sturdy, the kind that does not need constant validation, it is not contingent on certain things. When we talk about contingent self-esteem in psychology, what we mean is that the kind of self-esteem that needs certain things to happen, right? So for example, if your self-esteem is contingent, say, on your finances or on your 
physical appearance or on how well you do in your job. All of these are contingent self-esteem. And obviously all of us, to a certain degree, if you care about something, of course your self-esteem is going to be a little bit contingent on those things. But when this starts to be problematic is when, first, when it's too much contingent, right? Like it really determines your whole outlook, let's say, how you are doing financially. And then it can become problematic if the sources of the self-esteem themselves are not very meaningful, right? Like, for example, with finances, if you are beyond a certain threshold where you can satisfy your needs, then putting too much value on material possessions, that actually is linked to poorer psychological outcomes. So I have digressed a little bit from the original question, but Contingent self-esteem uh, can become problematic and a non-fragile ego is less contingent and it requires less validation from others. Maybe one last thing I can add is if your ego is not as fragile, it also helps to make you more authentic, more authentic in the way that you are more willing to follow your own path, your own bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say, because you do not put too much stock on what others want, what the society says. Rather, you follow your inner compass, right? Because your ego does not need others' validation. And that's actually another reason why humility is linked to happiness, because humbler people are better at following the inner compass, the, their inner compass, than people who are trying to almost create a product out of themselves that the outside world will approve of or will like. What people like to call a brand now. People don't even think of themselves as a person. Yep. You know, you're a brand, you have your own website and you're growing your public illusion, if you will, which is what a brand is. But it sounds like what you're talking about is mental health. And yep. how does humility help us deal with depression, anxiety, stress, yes. addictions, all these things that are plaguing our society right now? They are, again, intimately related. As I said at the beginning, at the core of humility is low self-focus. On the other hand, when we look at mental problems, we see that they have in common this high self-focus. When you look at different psychological disorders that at first sight don't seem like they have a lot in common. Think about, I mean, let's start with narcissism, obviously, but also think about, for example, paranoia, paranoid disorder or eating disorders, or social anxiety, generalized social anxiety, what do they all have in common? Again, too much self-focus. Obviously, in narcissism, there is too much self-focus. But also in paranoid episodes where a person is thinking that they are being followed, or eating disorders, for example, or bodily dysmorphic disorders where a person is obsessed with their physical appearance. Again, too much self-focus. Social, uh, generalized social anxiety disorder, too much self-focus. Mental health and too much self-focus are antithetical. They do not go together, unfortunately. In humility, on the other hand, there is this sense of common humanity. Humble people, they have more of this. They, as I again, as I said at the beginning, they see themselves on the same plane as others. As a human being, they believe that they are deserving as much as the other person, not more, not less. And another part of this common, this perception of common humanity is also, for example, when you are experiencing certain problems, you can say, well, it's, it's the human condition. Like if my fellow people are having this problem, why shouldn't I? If everybody is going through something, why shouldn't I? So whereas a narcissistic person, when they experience something unwanted, their first reaction is, why me? A humble person, on the other hand, their reaction would be, why not me, right? Because if everybody has some unwanted things happen to them in life, why shouldn't it happen to them either, right? 
So because of all of these reasons, we expect that humble people have better psychological health. And there are studies that even if they are limited, they are promising in supporting this claim. This is very powerful stuff. It certainly is. I'd like to go back to when we first heard about Pellin from Sheldon Solomon, because as Steve said, you're going to get a lot of these ideas about humility and gratitude from your original teachings, which Steve and I were taught really from the first half of the 20th century, where our families were still grounded in the traditional religious teachings. And so we were informed by that in our youth, like you were talking about truth, I think Steve and I both agree that there's such a thing as truth, which a lot of the postmodernists think that that's just a construction of culture and and truth is whatever you can get away with, as I think Andy Warhol said. So my question is, for young people for whom these ideas, maybe they're hearing them for the first time, and maybe they didn't grow up with a family that was grounded in any kind of tradition that gave them something to hold on to, how can humility be cultivated for young people who grew up in a, a looser, less secure world than we did? And is there any hope for that? Mm-hmm. Great, great question. Thank you so much for asking. The question of how humility can be cultivated, it's actually also a question about what determines humility, what is it shaped by? And I should say that there's certainly also a genetic heritable component to it because with any personality trait we do know that part of it is genetic so some people are born maybe they might be born with higher level of neuroticism which makes them feel like more insecure inside and we know neuroticism is heritable to a certain degree and then maybe a personality trait such as agreeableness which is related to being more empathic Again, we know that it is related to genes and is to a certain extent heritable. So we are aware of that, right? You cannot take just any person and then bring them to a like a 10 out of 10 level of humility. Just with any personality trait, there are constraints on, on a person. But then what are the things that can be done to cultivate a more humble young person? Well, first of all, I think parents should know that just providing security, genuine security and being just responsive parents, that makes a difference. When a person experiences inner safety, that is going to cultivate higher levels of this non-fragile ego, right? When a child knows that he or she is accepted unconditionally, loved unconditionally, that helps, that makes a difference. But then what about the greater culture or the, let's say in the school, what can be done to make a person, a young person more humble? I would say what makes the biggest difference is involving young people in civic projects and making them engage in projects where they help others, make them engage in pro-social activities as part of the curriculum. I do believe it's really powerful and it's really important to let young people experience the joy that comes from doing something that goes beyond them, right? And sometimes young people don't even know the pleasure of that because their own world is just consists of entirely different things. So those are the things that occur to me. But I also want to emphasize that religions are actually, they are very powerful in disseminating this message about the importance of humility. And in any, I cannot imagine any religion that does not emphasize humility as an important virtue. When that's missing from a young person's life, then there need to be other ways that need to be found. Unfortunately, we're in an era where the power of religion has greatly diminished, which is not to say religion has gone away. It certainly hasn't. And it's not to say that most people have religion in their lives to some degree. But let's face it, the modern Western person thinks about religion once a week and money 10 times a day. 
it hardly has the power that it had on the pilgrims or the Middle Ages or in certain cultures like the Muslim culture where you see people praying regularly, whereas you could go to a thousand business meetings in America and none of them start with a prayer or end with a prayer. It's not part of the day-to-day life. And Steve, as you and I have talked about, there's a lot of modern public intellectuals who think that just because we've gotten to this post-Freudian world that we can just get rid of religion like we don't need it anymore. Like someone refers to it as a mind virus. Or Sam Harris, the famous atheist, saying that religion is just, oh, I like the buildings and I like the music, but the rest of it, you know, you can keep and we don't need it anymore. And this is a perfect sphere where we're talking about something that religion brought with it, a sense of of humility and gratitude for your life, for what brought you into the world, and that you owe something to other people. I guess my point is there were a lot of things that religion brought in addition to explaining thunder and lightning and providing an afterlife for people who can't face the harsh realities of, of living. So, Pelham, you were talking about young people developing, cultivating humility in young people. How about society as a whole? How about old farts like Ken and me that are, that are beyond yeah. upbringing, but yet live in this, in this culture of individualism and self-aggrandizement and mm-hmm. achievement? I know this is an impossible question, but you know, if you would take a shot at it, how do we make the world better through humility? Yeah, well, I feel anything that helps us feel more secure and more accepting of ourselves, first of all, that is going to help us become more humble. Because, for example, when we look at this desire to feel superior to others, right? Like, it's almost like an indicator of your stress levels or you, an indicator of your discontent in the moment. That's when you feel like, like disparaging others in some way or you just want to feel superior to others so that you can feel okay about yourself. yourself. So that is, an, that is an expression of feeling, yeah, just feeling insecure about yourself. So anything that you can do to make yourself genuinely more content with yourself and more accepting of yourself, that is going to help you become more humble, I would say. Other ways in which we can cultivate humility is because these are all related virtues. For example, when we cultivate gratitude, when we practice gratitude, it can be in the form of keeping gratitude journals, or it can be in the form of maybe having when you are around the table with your family, you can talk about what you are grateful today. So when you cultivate gratitude, I believe you would also simultaneously be cultivating humility. Another way to cultivate humility, I would say, is when we cultivate this feeling of awe. For example, when we are in nature and we feel the connection to something that is larger than ourselves, that can also create a sense of humility, which would be very helpful. Wonderful. This is excellent, excellent advice. I'll say. So, Pelham, thank you for an excellent conversation. I hope you'll be our guest again. We We actually have a lot more to talk about, although we've covered quite a bit today. I would love that. It was such a such a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. This was just great. Thanks. And Take care. We'll be in touch. You've been listening to an interview with social psychologist Pellen Kesebeer on humility, the quiet ego, intellectual humility, and our American society. Steve, what's your takeaway? Well, I came away thinking there was a lot of wisdom in what Pellen was saying. She has a coherent system of interconnected ideas that all make sense. Well, I agree. And I thought her talk was both honest and true. Right. A good way to put it. Pellin speaks of humility as proper knowledge of ourselves, both our strengths and our weaknesses. 
we can afford an honest look at ourselves, and at the same time, we're okay with it. We're accepting of it. We do not feel inferior when there are certain areas where we are weak, and we don't feel superior to others in areas where we're better than others. She says, however, she doesn't think it's easy. That's why we don't necessarily see that many humble people. It's not easy to feel secure in this world that is inherently insecure and where we are fragile. Yes, yeah, she's conducted five social psychological studies and found that some higher levels of humility are associated with lower death anxiety and lower defensiveness in the face of death thoughts. People were less likely to respond to death thoughts with prejudicial attitudes towards outgroups or with endorsements of self-serving yet unethical behaviors. This is all very interesting. Uh, her work is isn't it? Yeah, it's fascinating. And I love the term a quiet ego. Yeah, me too. Isn't that great? Yeah. Uh, she uses it to mean a healthy kind of self-esteem, calm, serene self-confidence that does not need to constantly advertise itself, that does not need to constantly promote itself. The loud ego, on the other hand, the boisterous ego, is in constant pursuit of promoting itself. She noted that there are many psychological studies that show that lots of mental disorders have hyper-egoism as their common core. Too much attention on the ego, too much self-focus, too much self in general. That sounds right. We talked a bit about happiness. She said it's not about feeling good all the time, but it's when we're content with life, just experiencing more positive, more constructive emotions. At the fundamental level, we feel okay, even if things are not always going our way, even if life does not always treat us the way that we would want to be treated. She believes that humility and an enduringly happy life are very much related. She noted that there are empirical studies that are starting to look at this question with some promising results, but that it's a very young field. She added that it's very difficult to measure humility. Yeah, and I like how she believes humility and wisdom are like the two sides of a coin. She can't imagine how a person could be wise without being humble and be humble without being wise. They're very much related. Yeah, I, I noticed uh, when she said that, I 100% I agree with the first one, wise without being humble, because humble is implicit in wise. But I think I've known some people who were, who were uh, humble and not wise. Wise is a wise is a tall order. Not a lot of people reach wise. Right. I uh, I like this. I, I I agree with you. I'm not I'm not disagreeing with that. Wise requires more than humility. It requires life experience. It requires a lot of experience. Yeah. Yeah. But it's I but some I, minimal amount of intelligence and being able to make connections between things. But I think the connection that she's making is really important. Oh, I agree completely. And I like this one. Self-sufficiency is a myth. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Isn't that great? Humble people are more aware of the interconnected nature of being. Martin Luther King used that expression in his famous speech. So that's what occurred to me when I heard it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. The interconnectedness of all things. Uh, so people are more in tune with the reality of existence and its interconnected nature. She said it's really important that these values find expression in the general culture. One of the most striking terms she uses is intellectual humility. She said it's about recognizing and owning our intellectual limitations and not being ego-defensive in our pursuit of truth. Intellectual humility involves respecting truth and valuing truth while being willing to reconsider our own views. When we're challenged, and rather than putting our ego first, rather than trying to be right all the time, when we're challenged, we need to avoid defensiveness and just strive for accuracy. We need to be more oriented towards the discovery of the truth rather than being oriented towards defending our ego. It's the opposite of intellectual arrogance or being closed-minded. And again, she feels it's a very difficult quality to cultivate. 
it does not come naturally to us for reasons that Ernest Becker delineated, because we want to believe in our current cultural worldviews. And we've been talking about this, you know, on podcast after podcast, along for quite a number of years. When we believe in something, it provides us with a sense of security that we're not willing to let go of easily. But she believes that if we could cultivate more intellectual humility, it will at least create more tolerance towards people who do not think like us. Yeah, and as we've talked about in several episodes, that's a really important thing to be striving for right now. Yep. Something we desperately need right now. She also uses the term a non-fragile ego, which I liked also. It describes someone who requires less validation from others. It also helps to make you more authentic in the way that you are more willing to follow your own path or uh, your own bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say. I knew your ears picked up at that one. Well, you know, I'm a huge Joseph Campbell fan. I always love when he finds his way into the conversation. (laughs) You're right. So we asked her about ways to cultivate humility, and she said what makes the biggest difference is involving young people in civic projects and getting them to engage in projects where they help others. I thought that was great. And encouraging them to engage in pro-social activities as part of the school curriculum. She believes it's really powerful and it's really important to let young people experience the joy that comes from doing something that goes beyond them. And that, to me, is so true. She suggested keeping gratitude journals which I've never tried or really thought of. Yeah, I've got several friends who keep those. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And for families, you know, when you're around the table with the rest of the family, you can talk about what you're grateful for today. You can cultivate gratitude simultaneously by cultivating humility. Yeah, it's great. She said another way to cultivate humility is when we cultivate a feeling of awe one of my favorite words, and things. For example, when we're in nature and we feel a connection to something that's larger than ourselves, that can also create a sense of humility. Well, Ken, all this gives me a lot of hope. I know. It does me too. And hope, as you said, it's hard to come by these days. Yes, it is. But Pellin's ideas are sincere and practical. Yes, they are. She's saying humility and gratitude can be cultivated, which will have a positive effect on our society. Important ideas, Steve. Hey, important ideas once again. Folks, join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. And support us on Patreon at www.patreon.com front slash the hub important ideas. We are 100% listener supported. Thank you for listening to the Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Stay safe, everybody. Stay well. This has been a Contemporary Heroism Initiative production.